It's been mentioned earlier that um, it's a lot easier to follow the Lord when we know where he's going. And if ye know these things, blessed are ye if. If what? That's right. Blessed are ye if ye do them. So we want to put the knowledge into our heads in order to apply it with our hands and sometimes with our feet. After all, we got here, didn't we? Now, most of Revelation explains scripture found earlier in the Bible. Now, otherwise, why would it be called Revelation? For example, in Daniel, we have chapters 2, 7, and 8. We have four beasts in Daniel 7. Collectively, how many heads do they have? Well, how many? That's right, because the third beast has four heads and ten horns. And we can compare this. We see it again in Revelation chapter 12 on the dragon. Only the diadems are on the heads. Again in Revelation 13, the beast that comes from the sea. And again, seven heads and ten horns. Only now the diadems are on the ten horns. And we have the theme repeated again in Revelation 17. Now, I will say that not everyone concurs on that. And we still have good fellowship, don't we? (laughs) In Daniel 8, ancient coins show the Persian ram and the ten horns. So, first, let's take a look. Trying to get this. um, Okay, it's working now. In uh, Daniel chapter 2, of course, we have the smiting of Nebuchadnezzar's image, and we'll see some evidence of that as we go along. And again, with the four beasts, we'll see some things that are significant. And then we have the ram and the he-goat, which represent um, the um, Grecian Empire following the Persian Empire or Medo-Persian Empire. The two-horned ram from the east is identified with that kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. I say, why do we have two of those? What does it mean, Persian? It comes from the word Paris. And if we remember, Mina, Mina, Tikal, Upharsin, Paris is identified as a division. The Paris or Persians are simply a division of the Medes. Then we have the he goat. Its great horn signifies the kingdom of Greece with its first great horn, which is Alexander the Great. Uh, By the way, if you're um, Iranian, uh, you don't call him that. You call him Alexander the Terrible. He slew two million people, which at that time was 2% of the world's population. And I don't think that anybody has accomplished that until we got to the 20th century again. Now, the Persian and the Macedonian coins of the time show how each empire used a particular animal to uh, represent itself, even as nations do today, the British lion, the American bald eagle. We'll see now uh, a Persian coin. This is a Medo-Persian coin, and what do they display on it? But a two-horned ram. Then we go further, and this is a Macedonian coin showing the Macedonian goat with the great horn. And that, of course, as we understand, is to represent its great first horn, Alexander the Great. And now we have still another coin to represent both. 
And in this coin, oops, I think I went one too far. We see in this coin, we have the Medo-Persian ram having been conquered by the goat with the great horn erected over the Persian ram. So these are fit symbols in Daniel, the uh, eighth chapter. We'll continue on now. I will suggest that uh, we have successive capitals here. That uh, of these seven heads, I will suggest that the simplest solution is that the first one is Babylon, the second, Medo-Persia, no problem so far, then the third one, Greece, the capital of Macedonia was Pella, and that's where Alexander came from. And now I will suggest that the next one that ruled over the Lord's people, that ruled over Israel and Judah, was Alexander, Alexandria in Egypt, the capital of Ptolemy, one of Alexander's generals, followed by Antioch in Syria, and that included Antiochus IV, Epiphanes, that uh, did such a terrible uh, destruction in uh, Judah and reconsecrated the temple to his own god. And then we had Rome. Now, this is my suggestion that John was writing in John's day, and that therefore that is why it is said that uh, one now is the sixth one, but we have a problem. When did Thrace ever rule over the Lord's people? It didn't happen until we get to Constantine, who builds the city of Byzantium up and re modestly renames it after himself, Constantinople. And so... Under Constantine, we now have the fourth head, and that's why, excuse me, yes, the fourth head of the Grecian Empire, we eventually do get to it to cover all seven. As we continue, whoops, I continued in the wrong direction. I always supposed I knew what a dragon looked like until I saw the Roman version of the dragon. There's a lot that can be said about it. But what we notice here is it has the body of a serpent. Is that appropriate? Harks back to the Garden of Eden. But the head of a wolf. And the wolf was the animal that the Thracians used to represent themselves. You remember how Romulus and Remus were suckled by a wolf? They're saying that they got their support from Thrace. In Genesis 10, we get down to the last member under Japheth is Tiras, Thrace. They established Tira, or Tyre, on the east coast of the Mediterranean. And when they went westward to the Italian peninsula, they were the Etruscans, the Iter Tiras, the goings of Tiras. And we still call the part west part of the uh, Mediterranean Sea just west of Italy, the Tyrrhenian Sea, the waters of Tyre, the running waters of Tyre. That's the Rhenian part. So this became the Roman imperial ensign only near about 300 A.D., we have manuscripts of Revelation that are older than that, so this could only be by prophecy, not by sub subsequently somebody saying, oh, well, we'll make it as though it had been. We proceed. There are two kinds of crowns shown in Revelation. One is what's called Stephanos in the Greek the laurel wreath of victory. And that's what we see the emperor Nerva showing almost at 100 A.D. 
But there's another kind of crown, a reigning crown. This by the Emperor Valens in the 4th century. And it looks like a single or double string of jewels. In this case, a double string of jewels. And that's the reigning crown. Seven heads and ten horns, and upon his heads, seven diadems. These various kings up through that time, through these empires from Babylon on, were doing their reigning, but we'll have to consider the ten horns in a moment. Now, uh, we talked about Daniel chapter 2 only briefly, but um, what do you see when you look at the map of Italy? What does it look like? <clears throat> does it look like a stone smiting Nebuchadnezzar's on the feet, knocking the legs out from under the Roman Empire? Sometimes our Lord doesn't leave much to the imagination. But as our scripture is, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, or as the American Standard Version gives it, we have also the word of prophecy made more sure. A stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image on the feet, that were of iron and clay, and break them in pieces, a kingdom which shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now, I will suggest here that um, the ten horns can be identified with specifically ten Germanic tribes which took over the entire Roman Empire. The first, when the Roman Empire came to an end, Romulus Augustus, the last emperor, was deposed and his no good uncle was murdered. Then uh, the Heruli, or the Heralds, took over. The, their king was a fellow named uh, Odovatser or Odoacer. Uh, he it was was in the Roman army. In fact, at that time, the Roman Empire was being propped up by Germanic soldiers. And so when things got too corrupt, he simply took over the empire. And uh, then he was ousted by the Ostrogoths. We won't go into detail on that now. And then afterwards, the Lombards came into the kingdom of Italy um, ultimately, all three of them got wound up uh, and uh, incorporated into the kingdom of Italy. Uh, if you go north of Rome, they still call uh, the, uh, the one province as Lombardy. And that's where it came from. But in addition, we have other tribes that were not so uh, swallowed up. We have, oopsie, I, I'm not too good with this button here. The Vandals, they took Sicily and North Africa. By the way, they're badly named. Apparently, they never did any vandalism. That was Roman propaganda. <laughs> then we have the Swaves, who took over Portugal. The Visigoths, who took over Spain. The Franks, who took the north and west parts of France. The Burgundians, the southeast part of France the Alamans in Germany, and, uh, you know, the French still call them, the Germans, as Alamans. And finally, the Anglo-Saxons in England. Now, let's have a look and see these coins and uh, count the number of coins. We won't spend a lot of time on each one. We can minimize that. But this is the coin of the heralds or heruli, and you can see the string of jewels there. That's the diadem. That's the first tribe. Let's go now to the second one. This is of the Ostrogoths, and uh, Theodotus uh, wears, a, wears the fanciest uh, diadem that I've ever seen. 
It's all jewels all over the place. And then one more. We have the queen of the Lombards. And you see that she also displays the diadem. How many coins of these have we seen so far? Okay. That's, that's good. Uh, we'll continue. Here we have the king of the Vandals. You notice his diadem here and again over here. And we have the king of the Swaves. You see his diadem. The king of the Visigoths. We see his diadem. Here is the Head of the Franks, Clovis, quite famous king. Here we have the Burgundians and that string of jewels. Theodobert of the Alamans. And that's a fairly uh, elaborate uh, crown of uh, diadem. And the Anglo-Saxon king, Again, he displays the diadem. How many of those displayed the di diadem? How many were there? Ten, exactly ten. So, we have first the diadems on the seven heads, and now we see that we have the diadems also shown on exactly ten Germanic tribes that took over every last square kilometer of the uh, Roman Empire. Now, how did the writer of Revelation know that? Ahead of time? Centuries ahead of time that this would come to pass? We have third century manuscripts of Revelation. How did they know that in the fifth and sixth centuries there would come to be exactly, not nine, not twelve, but ten Germanic tribes that would display the diadem of the Roman Empire. By the way, there was a practical reason for gaining the Roman emperor's permission to display that diadem. And that was so that their monies would all be considered valid throughout the Roman Empire, even in the East Roman Empire. Okay, consider now the devil and the dragon from Revelation 12.9. The great dragon was cast down, the old serpent, he that is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was cast down to the earth. So now we go and see how uh, Constantine viewed the matter. We see Constantine here. He's got the diadem. This is before the breakup. But notice on the back side of the coin, he sees what he has done as erecting the cross over the fallen dragon. Below him is a, a successor named Constantius. He and his wife were both Arians, not Trinitarians. We notice that he has the cross here and he has he's showing the dragon under his feet. Does he know something about Revelation? At least this is how he views the matter. Uh, we'll go on to another one. Let's see. Um, So the last time we see the seven heads and ten horns, that's in Revelation chapter 17. Seven mountains are mentioned in verse 9. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So we take a look at another Roman coin. And uh, do we see over here Rome pictured as a woman sitting on can you count the number of hills? Seven. Seven is right. Seven hills. And for what else it's worth, you see down here, that's the wolf in the picture again. Uh, 
another little trivium here. This is a papal coin. And we note on the back side of it, we see the woman holding out this golden cup of apostasy. Do we think of the scriptures? Jeremiah 51, 7. Babylon hath been a golden cup in Jehovah's hand that maketh all the earth drunken. And again, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and gilded with gold and precious stone and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations. Now, you'd have think they'd have been a little bit smarter than to make a coin like this. <laughs> But we can see here evidence that our interpretation of prophecy need not be guesswork. Anytime we have evidence, we have a much stronger confidence that we are understanding the prophecy correctly. So for our interpreting of prophecy... Sound interpretation of prophecy should not be guesswork. We need evidence, cross-references, because Revelation is revealing things earlier in the Bible, and a good dose of common sense. Now, Mark Twain once said that common sense is not so common. And if you want to look up commentaries, if you want um, five interpretations of Revelation, you ask four commentaries. But if we have evidence, we can narrow it down considerably. So, our conclusions and our deductions. The seven heads are seven successive world-class empires which sequentially bear rule over most of the Lord's people as well as over most of the world. Hence, it would appear the prophecies of chapters 12, 13, and 17 were seen by those who lived during the papal reign and the Protestant era. So it is chapters 14 to 16 and 18 that remained to be fulfilled towards the end of the gospel age, that is, during the last day of the gospel age, the seventh day. Now, perhaps we mentioned earlier Joshua. At Jericho, he marched around the city how many times? Seven, Seven times. And uh, how many times on the last day? That's right. How many priests? That's right. When you're talking about Joshua at Jericho, if somebody asks the question, you say seven, you'll probably be right. <laughs> and they had seven trumpets. So, what we see is the gospel age from the time that Joshua rose early, starts with Jesus' resurrection, seven days that the gospel age is divided into, and also the activities of the last day, the last day in which we live, seven distinct events. Now, what might we expect in coming years? Well, the events of the last day are seen in Revelation chapters 14 six to 16 and 18. But there's no mention of Christ's second advent in chapters 12, 13, or 17. The reliable expectations for the next several decades are more likely to be found by considering that the last day is divided into the seven parts, and thence by studying the seven last plagues of Exodus and Revelation. And as Israel continues to return to their land in accordance with Ezekiel 37, as we've heard earlier, one may watch uh, the, how rapidly the eastern and western blocks of Ezekiel 38 are coming together.
Now, this is just a suggestion as to the seven periods of the Gospel age. Don't want to spend a lot of time on it. In Ezekiel, the second chapter, it tells about the scroll. We have the scroll again in Revelation, but it's written on the inside and the outside. And uh, on the inside are written lamentations, plural, mourning, singular, and woe, singular. Suggest the reason for that is the lamentations, uh, whoopsie, wrong thing, back we go again. The um, lamentations come in the first place and the fourth place, apart from each other. The mornings are consecutive, and the three woes are consecutive. And we have, again, the three woes in Revelation. Under the lamentation, the white horse, the gospel goes forth under the Jewish domination. Uh, Don't worry, they're not mad. (laughs) And uh, the mourning, the red horse, under bloody heathen Rome. Or maybe I should say that a little bit different if somebody has a British background. The um, third one, which would be the time of Arius and afterwards until the uh, papacy is established in power, the black horse would be under what they called Christian Rome, regardless of whether it was or not. Then the lamentation again, the pale horse, that would represent papal Rome starting in 539. Oh, if you said 538, or it's got to be no later than the spring uh, equinox of 540. But then we have three woes. First starting with a star that falls from heaven. Well, that would seem to be perhaps the papal star at the time of the Reformation when People no longer everywhere regarded the Pope as uh, the voice of heaven. Then we have uh, the second woe where the four horses are loosed. And it suggests that that would represent the period that started with Protestant uh, expansion worldwide, taking the gospel worldwide. Include the work of the Bible societies, include the work of Joseph Wolfe, who is the second Advent preacher, not simply to this country, but to Europe and the whole world. I think he got to every continent except Antarctica. There just wasn't many to preach to there. And then the seventh woe, that would be concerning the Gospel Age harvest. And there, uh, finally, we get to the kingdom of the world is to be the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And that is what we are looking forward to, that thousand-year kingdom of Christ. Now, I will suggest seven last plagues. We have it in Exodus, seven last plagues out of the ten. So what's different about the seven last plagues out of ten? The first three plagues fall upon the Egyptians and the Israelites. And then the Lord makes a division between the peoples. He says, you go tell Pharaoh, I'm going to make a distinction between my peoples, that there be no more plagues in the land of Goshen where my people dwell. And uh, so from that point on, the plagues fall only upon the Egyptians and not upon the Lord's people, the Israelites. And uh, can we kind of get a suggestion here as to what that might represent? Well, one more thing. Moses comes to Egypt, you know, to administer all these plagues, but he doesn't administer the first three plagues. It's always, say unto Aaron thy brother, do this. Say unto Aaron thy brother, do that. Say unto Aaron thy brother, do the third thing. But when the Lord separates the peoples, then he says um, it's Moses that does the administering of the plagues. If Aaron does anything, Moses is doing it too. It has certain advantages, like um, when the murrain killed the cattle of Egypt, 
Uh, where is Egypt going to get renewed cattle? On the you know, supply and demand says the prices have gone up. The benefit of Israel. Then uh, we have things like the plague of the um, hail and it destroys the first two crops of Egypt. That's the barley and the flax. Well, now, where are they going to get their barley and their flax from? And again, the price has gone up. The next thing, uh, maybe seven weeks later, like around Pentecost, there comes another plague. That's the plague of the locusts. And that, now that the wheat and the spilled have grown up, it eats up the wheat and the spilled of Egypt. And once again, the price of wheat and spell goes up to the benefit of the Israelites. Well, I will suggest that we have seen the first five of these things. The flies represent the long depression, starting in 1873 and continues into the 1890s, about two decades long. The murrain that killed the cattle, World War I, now, that's a destructive plague. You see that uh, marked by this um, little bomb. The next one doesn't have one of those little bombs by it. Uh, it was an annoying plague, the blames on man and beast. Well, we have the Great Depression. Originally, the Long Depression was called the Great Depression until now they needed the term for the one in the 1930s. But followed that, hail, thunder, and lightning. Again, with our little, oops, pressing the wrong button again. That uh, it, the destructive plague might well correspond to World War II. And then the next destructive plague, the communist threat, the East versus West communist threat, which continued for decades. Now, the next to last plague is a plague of darkness. Okay, it lasted for three days. It's not a destructive plague. It might picture, let's watch and see, a deep depression. And if so, will it last three years? I don't know, but I sure will be watching. And finally, there's not much question that the death of the firstborn is the Armageddon plague. And we may keep in mind that the firstborn of Israel are not delivered until we see in progress the destruction of the firstborn of Egypt or the heirs of Satan's kingdom. We need not expect there that the church will be complete until we see Armageddon begin and, of course, we don't expect to be here right at that point of time. The church should, as soon as the light of the world goes out, that'll be the total darkness in Armageddon. Okay, we'll continue now. This is the important part we're getting into. What should we do because of what we believe? This is not just intellectual stimulation. This should be our motivation. If the Lord is returned and now present, the call has gone out. Come forth, my people. Come forth out of sectarian bondage, out of Babylon, that ye have no fellowship with her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues. I might mention that by virtue of coming out of Babylon, we don't experience some of the things that Babylon is having troubles with. One of them is how to keep the church funded. Another is what do you do when some of your seminary professors are teaching that the Bible is not strictly true, not entirely reliable, if reliable at all. Have we had that problems among Bible students? 
We got our own problems, and they're plenty enough for us, but we don't have to have those problems, and we shouldn't. If we come out for the purpose that we be not partakers of her sins. Now, Brother Russell has a short article in one place, just a single paragraph long, entitled, Do Not Urge the Unready to Come Out of Babylon. Now, how about those who stay in? We still have a duty to be merciful to each and every one of them. We may be glad that sectarian boundaries are being torn down, but we are not to be glad at the suffering of the people inside as they see them being torn down, which they considered to be their protection which in fact were their unfortunate restraints. And another important one is, as we see the growing hatred of Israel, in some cases, hatred of Israel and all Jews, but in other cases, they concentrate on Israel, even if in fact they don't say they hate the Jews worldwide. So as that prejudice against Israel grows and grows and grows, just let's stay off that bandwagon. If we know where the Lord is going, we don't want to get in front of the steamroller. What else should we do now because of what we believe? I would suggest that it looks like what's happening in sectarianism is that the Lord is allowing leftist atheism and Islam to gang together for the destruction of Israel and Christianity. The Lord has said he's not going to let them destroy Israel. And we've seen this with all the miracles that it's taken God to deliver Israel from what seems certain destruction. But he's not said so about Christianity. And there was one time at the county fair, a fellow came to the booth, and I simply told him, if the Lord allows Christianity to be destroyed, there is nevertheless a consolation prize for the Christian. The world will not be able to blame Christ for Armageddon. He looked at me, he says, That thought alone was worth coming to the fair for. (laughs) Now, we can expect darkness, the dry river of Revelation, many years before Armageddon, because that's not the last plague, that's the next to last. We should prepare for depression, in case that's what it means, And what shall we do? There's two things to do to prepare. I don't know how much else one can do. And that is get out of debt and stay out of debt. To the extent that we are able, let us use modern technology for public and personal witness while still we are able to do so. In a depression, that can be taken away from us. And we can encourage our Jewish friends to learn the Bible, learn Hebrew, and to make Aliyah. Well, it's still possible to do so freely. Because the time may come like it gets to be what it was in Germany under Hitler. Hitler.